Hello everyone. So today I'm going to give some advice on how to approach comparison essays in art history. Um, they're a very common type of essay, whether you are in high school or taking AP art history and preparing for the AP exam, or if you're in university and um, at a bachelor's level, they show up frequently on exams throughout all different types of fields within art history. And so I just wanted to go through and talk to you about the best ways to approach it, where to start, um, examples of good comparison and good analysis versus some weaker comparison, um, just so that you can see really how to bring your essays to the next level and offer some tips on how to start because if you haven't had to do something like this before, maybe you're new to it or you haven't taken a lot of classes in the field, it can be really difficult to know where to start. Okay, so in my experience, there's a few different ways your teachers or professors or college board go ahead and set up the exam. Um, there's the type of comparison that is popular on the AP exam, which is where they give you one image and then a prompt that you have to answer and a few other images and you get to choose one. Um, so that's one style or the type that was more common at my university was they would give you two images and maybe some sort of prompt, but a lot of times they would just give you two images and expect you to come up with what you wanna talk about and what you wanna focus your paper on. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you advice on how to approach both. Okay, so where do you start with your comparison? For my example, I'm gonna be using a painting called Banquet Still Life by Adrienne Van Utrecht from 1644 and another still life painting called Vanita Still Life by Jacques de Claude from 1650. Also, sorry if I'm not pronouncing those perfectly. Um, I don't speak Dutch and I do tend to have trouble with the pronunciation. Okay, so when you're looking at these two paintings, um, what you wanna do to start is you wanna decide what is the most baseline comparison you can make. What is the main similarity they have? Now, typically your professor or your teacher are gonna be choosing paintings that do have something in common. There's going to be a theme to it and it's probably going to be relating to the theme of the class. So obviously for these two, the big theme is that they are both Dutch golden age still life oil paintings. Now that's a fairly niche category that narrows it down significantly to what you need to be talking about. However, that is not analysis. A lot of people will write that down as their similarity, thinking that it's going to get them points. However, it's not at the level of being analysis. That's basically just you read the titles, you looked at the image, and that's the first thing you came up with. That coming up with that is what helps you then in your intro paragraph when you're talking about giving historical context and setting up the scene for your paper. That's where you discuss that and draw in some of the historical movements for why Dutch still life became such a major topic or some of the goals of still life that you're going to be talking about later in the paper. However, you need to come up with a deeper comparison. So how do you do that? So a good way to start is try to decide what the goal of the artist is with these paintings. Now typically for a comparison, the paintings are going to be different enough to where the artists probably have different goals in mind. However, they very well could be trying to achieve these goals in a very similar manner. For example, both of these paintings are still lifes, which means they are both a collection of objects carefully chosen and laid out in a specific way in order to promote a certain vision or a certain lifestyle or a certain image that the artist wants you to have. One thing both of these paintings have in common is both of these artists want you to feel as if you're looking into a snapshot of life, like this is a scene that you happened upon and it's capturing a moment in time. They both do this to achieve different goals and they both have a different reason for creating this effect. However, they use similar methods to create this effect. For example, when we look at Banquet Still Life, if you look closely, there's a lot of movement. Even though this is just, a, other than the animals, a collection of objects, you can see the lemon peel coming off the end of the table. You can see the sheets draped with fruit falling off of it. You can see the monkey posed to where it looks like it's just about to pluck a berry off of that tree or vine. You also see that there is the instruments that are stacked up kind of haphazardly with the sheet music that looks like it was flown open. 
all of these I items and details add a sense of movement to the painting. It looks like, even though this is a collection of still objects painted in oils, it looks like everything is movement, moving and in motion. It looks like you happen to take a photograph of a scene, maybe a moment before chaos happens. It looks like things are about to fall, they're about to change, you're just having a quick snapshot of what's happening. The Vanita still life does the same thing. If you look at the glass on the table, it kind of looks like it's at an angle to where if it was on a, a real object on a real table, it would roll because it's a round object on a flat surface. If you look at the seals on the paper, they look like they're falling over it and the paper looks like it's crunching up in a way that would probably uncrunch over time. There's also the crucifix of Jesus where he is laid on the books kind of haphazardly as though he's almost about to fall even further. And even the book pages, the pages are stretched out, they're not closed tight, so any sense of wind or movement would shuffle those pages. So both of these artists are using minute details in order to create a sense of movement and a sense of feeling. They do so to achieve different ends, however, they are using a very similar technique, and that is something you can use as a similarity. So once you have a strong similarity, something that relates back to the artist's intent, something that is probably the thing that drove both of these paintings, you can use that to lead you into the differences. Now, typically differences are a lot easier to find. You can find them between these paintings just by looking at them. However, again, you can't just say something like, one has more objects, one has less. One uses brighter colors, one uses darker colors. One is more in focus versus the other painting has a more hazy feel to it without saying any reason why. It's not enough to just say these are some differences, you need to explain why they're different and what that achieves in the paintings. One good thing to know is you should never be like, oh, this painting has a lobster and this painting doesn't. There should always be a one-to-one -one correlation. This painting is vivid and bright and energetic. This painting, painting is more muted and subtle with more sepia tones and a little hazier. That way, you're not making any weak comparisons if you make sure you can draw comparison between both. So one painting is more vivid where the other painted is painting is more muted. One painting has objects of wealth and opulence and extravagance, and the other one has objects more related to death and the fleetingness of life. Why is this? Exactly that. So the first painting, the point of it is to really go in and to show off the wealth of the owner of the painting. It's to show off what they have in all of their objects and items and to be an object of beauty. That's the point of it. However, the other painting, the Vanita Still Life, it's a Vanita painting, which if you're not familiar with Dutch Still Life, means that it's talking about the fleetingness of life. At this time period, the Dutch had a lot and a lot of money, but they were also very Calvinist and very religious. So this painting is more to show off the idea that you can't bring the objects with you into the afterlife, they're just stuff. Things like the skull and the flowers that will wilt and the crucifix that are about to fall over all point to that type of painting. Now this is good because if you maybe don't have any knowledge on the subject or weren't showing up to class, you probably wouldn't know that. So by using your differences to prove that point, proves to your professor, proves to your teacher that you know what you're talking about, makes you sound more of an expert in the topic. That's why I said you should always start by looking at the paintings and trying to decide the goal and the intent of the artist. Because not only should your similarity relate to it or your similarities, but your differences should as well. Your entire argument should consist of looking at both paintings and deciding how the artists both create a specific intent or achieve a specific purpose, both through using some techniques or methods or ideas that are similar, as well as what they do differently, which makes the intent of the paintings different. Now, this is what you should do if you are just given two paintings and asked to compare. If you are given a specific prompt, everything needs to lead back to that prompt. You need to start with the prompt and then go and analyze your similarities as well as your differences. 
Now this is what you should do if you are just given two paintings and asked to compare. If you are given a specific prompt, everything needs to lead back to that prompt. You need to start with the prompt and then go and analyze your similarities as well as your differences.